the, the last speaker of this morning is Professor Jian Shi Seng. She's from the uh, uh, Department of Geography. And Professor Jian is excellent uh, professor in, in our university. And he's uh, always uh, touching on a great important uh, issues that we are facing uh, in our society. Um, and he's also very smart. So today he's, go <laughs> he's going to talk about this, uh, the smart, so, right? Authoritarians versus uh, democratic. So, uh, Shi Sen, that's yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gui Tian, and uh, Tang Quan's uh, uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for Gui Tian's invitation, and thank you for you just met before. And we just talk about a lot of the issue about the digitalization and the sustainabilities. And today, I just want to see the outcome and consequences. Just the way I want to share with you about the two stories in Asia. And the way I try to think about that is because I think all of you must be believe the digitalization or all of the digital development or digital revolution will be ever irreversible. So that is something we need to face it. But in the other way, we also have different kind of the political systems. So how the political systems respond to that? In Asia, it's obviously in Taiwan, we are a democratic system, and we have a very powerful right, uh, civil society. We have very powerful NGO, non-government organizations uh, participating in every kind of the policies. But in Asia, probably everyone also know the rise of the China is kind of the signal to say something about the rise of the authoritarian regime. The rise of the China has uh, many things, uh, intervenes uh, many other Asian countries uh, through the project of the one bear, one row, not just only in Asia, but also in Africa. And they turn promoting another kind of the authoritarian state society relationships. So what does that mean to the digitalization? What does that mean to the different political systems, the consequences uh, to face the digitalization, to face the, that kind of the new ways of the life? So my title will be Authoritarian Smart and Democratic Smart. Obviously, the Authoritarian Smart is the case of the China, and Democratic Smart is the case of Taiwan. Not just because we are from Taiwan, it's because the way we are dealing with the smart issues uh, through the democratic means uh, is one of the very successful stories in the world. And uh, some of the challenges uh, and opportunities. And I will like to tell you about the two stories uh, rather than two lectures, okay? So it's not, it's, it will be very easy. You will, everyone will just listen to the stories rather than some of the theories and the discourses, the debate. So the context will be overall about the SDG, and then the two is one is a citizen driven. Citizen driven is a means of the, we are not really rely on the scientists, rely, rely on the experts, not really rely on the government. We are do something by our own, by the citizens. And the other one is a state-led authoritarian. And in China's case, it's a party state-led. They are really a party state. And then the final is with something about a little bit theoretical about the continuity and transformation and different kind of the power and the implication to the whole world. So the background is you get back to the, the end of the last centuries that there has a debate about what happened to the world and how we can do. And the United Nations actually uh, get a lot of the experts only, not many civil society groups at the time. So it's only experts uh, and then some of the, the government officers uh, from different countries, uh, most uh, from the North countries. Uh, and they say, we need to do something. They call it about the MDG, the Millennium Development Goals. You can see easy. Number one is many is about the social development. Only one is about environment development. And they are only saying about uh, the rich countries should do something to the poor countries. Okay? And that is about uh, try to make the goal uh, at the end of last century to say in 2015 we must do something together in order to make the world much better. But in 2016, just five years ago, 
a lot of things never been done. So that is the reason they think about we need to do something again together. So that is the reason to say about what does it mean by sustainability. Sustainability it means not just only for the social dimension. If you look at the last century's uh, nation, uh, international discourse, it's about the poverty, it's about the primary education, it's about the gender equality, it's about the child mortality, uh, about the maternity health. That kind of issue is a more, more social dimension rather than economic dimension and just only one for the environmental dimension. But recently, everything has been changed, particularly the change in the past 15 years, from the 2000 to 2015. The number one issue is about the climate change issues. So the environment has become even more important. So not just only for the people's social dimension, but also for the planet environmental dimensions. Another one is the 2008 financial crisis. So a lot of the rich countries also has the inequality within their countries and also has the economic inflection, the economic stagnation issues. So the other way is about the prosperity. Economic is become also very important. And the people, prosperity, planet, and then the partnership and peace become 5P. That is another very important uh, trend and the international discourse is about the sustainability in the whole world. Related to that is another very key issue is in 2015, the United Nations transformed from MDG to become the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. You can see 17 goals and then five roughly is about the social dimension, the poverty, hunger, health, education, and then the gender. And the other five is roughly about the environment. You can see the clean water, energy, climate actions, life below water, and then the life on land. And then the other five is roughly about the economic, such as the decent work and economic growth, such as industry infrastructure, reduced inequality, sustainable cities and communities, and then the responsible consumption and productions. And the other one is the peace and justice. That's very important in the many, uh, many different conflicts, uh, cities, and countries. And last one is the partnerships. So you see, that is something about the international discourses. That is something about the international agenda. We need to do everything together. And in here, you can see the infrastructure, you can see the innovation, you can see the community is very important, particularly for the cities. And that is another uh, context. The context is the urbanization. In 2012 or 2016 or 13, the half of the world population has been stay in urban. The other one is uh, about the right now is the digitalization or the industrialization zero or 4.0. It's about the different kind of the industry revolutions. Put together, is we thinking about to use the smart solution, use the digital solution to solve a lot of problems, particularly many problems that is based in the urban areas. So if we can gather the cities, if we can gather the citizens in the different cities to do together, and we can change the whole world. We can make the revolutions uh, and make our life become better. So the two stories. Before the two stories, it's about how can we understand the political systems. The political system matters. That is some about argument about the environmental issues. There is an authoritarian environment and a democratic environment. That is a paper published by the Bruce Deary. And they talk about the authoritarian environmentalism and democratic environmentalism. And they use China as a case, always saying that because of the powerful of the state capacity, because of the power of the state without taking anything about the concern of the societies. So the China developed very fast about their green energies. They develop a lot of things to make the life a little bit better, a little bit green, something like that. So the argument is about the authoritarian environmentalism. Somehow 
can contribute something good. And it's sometimes a challenging argument about the democratic or environmentalism is good. But I just want to let you know about maybe something different. So I will tell you about the two stories. One is about Taiwan. It's a democratic uh, smart. The other one is authoritarian smart in China. So the story of Taiwan is not because we are in Taiwan. It's because with some of the researches, some of the civic scientists hubs in the whole world, Taiwan is one of three. The other two is the open knowledge is based in American. And another one is code for American, also based in American. And then the third one is GOV, GLINV. GLINV is, we, we, they try to say it's kind of the G, government GOV, but it's translated to the O to the zero. It's everything from zero. It also means that, that is our things, so we should do that from zero. It's different from the government, but also similar to the government. We need to do something to solve the problems uh, that government has been created. So number one is this idea of the budget visualization. Everyone knows the budget is very important. The government budget has been a lot of the impacts to all our life. But when we see the budget, we just see the budget book, all numbers, all different items. We didn't know how they increase. We didn't know how they put the money in different kind of the ministries or departments, everything. But in Taiwan, some of the civic scientists and some of the non-government organization activists try to organize the visualization of the budget books. And the idea is it's easy to hang, in, hang on, so everyone can join. And it's open source. So everyone can create their programs. So that is become the free software. Because if we really want to do everything on computer, we need the programs. Another one is you need to be public uh, spirit. You need to believe we can do something together online. That is uh, do something for the public good. So that is a public spirit. Hand on is become social activism. So we need to do something as the activists uh, rather than go to the, on the street. You can go online. And we also can do something together, not just only see each other online, or uh, see each other on the street. We also can see each other through the social medias and a lot of the civic medias. So that together become the concept of the GDV. And that is the idea of the 2012, the proposed uh, visualization of the government budget book. And then 2015, they even cooperated with the Taipei city government. And then 2016, a lot of the city governments follow up because Taiwan is a democratic society and there is a pressure from the different voters in their countries, in their cities to say we need to do something together. So the budget books used to be just only statistics and then the numbers, but right now become kind of a location you can see this is the Bureau of the uh, Education. This is the uh, uh, Bureau of the, uh, for example, the engineer. So you can understand easily about the government, how they spend the money for us. And even you can see the, the change in, inside the bureaus. So some, they are putting the money only for the personnel affairs, or some put the money to the infrastructure, put some everything. For the a lot of the ordinary people to understand the importance of the budget, to understand the allocation of the budget by the digital means through the participation of the civil society organizations and groups. That is number one story. The number two story is about the location aware sensing system for the environmental sensors. As everyone understands the PN.5 is very serious issues for the air pollution. And right now, this, is, this one uh, is by the Academia Seneca, the Information Science Institute. So it's actually some of the scientists within the academia also cooperate with the civil society activities together 
online and together collecting more data through their development by the one company is called the Airbus, the Kong Chi Hertz. There are some of the small Airbus for sensing the quality of the air pollutions. They put together and become the map. And another people for uh, very in good in information science and very good in mapping the data, even produce the data to become the, the, the map of Taiwan to see how seriously of the pollution issues in southern part of the, of the Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan. And you can see the differences. This is the official data only by the Ministry of the Economic Affairs. And you see that there's only few points of the official sensor data. So it become very, very not persuasive because the, city, the citizens inside the city saying this is a terrible of the air pollution. But the government say no, according to our data, it's not. But right now they say no, according our data, according to the data from the citizen societies uh, to say this is really serious issues. And we show you the map by some people else has been done for us. And they, oh, okay, okay, okay. So become kind of the power to negotiate with the government to say you need to change your policy. Otherwise, your data is not that convinced to us at all. And we have the more data to say we are right. Uh, we are the better position to say you need to change. So that is another way of the also a democratic smart. The third case is the campaign finance open up this database. The campaign finance is very serious issues uh, to influence uh, all of the legislators, uh, local councillors, uh, and the mayors uh, in the election systems. But in Taiwan, that data only restored in the government offices and nobody can understand who contribute, who donate how much money to which elected legislators. But through the process of the activities together with the civil society groups, they are a lot of the volunteers to scan the all of the data written books to become the digital files put into online and then another volunteers to type all of the numbers become the Excel profiles. And that would be very easy for everyone to understand who donate how much money to the which legislators and what is their voting behaviors for the serious particular sensitive law making processes. The voters uh, need to know the legislators uh, or the local councillors uh, what they vote in favor to which kind of the companies uh, or which kind of the industries. And that is very important to open up this kind of the black box for the political negotiation, bargaining, power, everything. And that is something happening in Taiwan. You can easily to see the civil society groups really neutralize the opportunities of the digitalizations to change many things, to change some of the social problems that Taiwan has been faced, such as the PM.5, such as the, like the corruption and related to the legislations, legislators, such as nobody know about the budget uh, allocation, all kind of the issues. That is one part of the story happening in Taiwan in terms of the democratic, oh sorry, uh, democratic smart processes. And then I move to the China. It's about the authoritarian smart processes. That is the big data meets the big brothers. And that is to China raise every citizen about the scores. And this is the 2006. 17, just last year, and that is the conference about the Chinese social credit system. That is the, 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 the organizer and sponsors is about the Shanghai Development and Reform Committee, Shanghai Fa Gai Wei, and then the Tengxun Corporation, it means the internet companies, and then the Jiao Tong Da Xue and then the Jiao Tong universities. So you can see the universities and the governments and then the corporates 
together is try to promote the idea of the social credit systems. How they do? The social credit systems, I just like to give the background for some of the foreigners uh, may not understand Taiwan, uh, may not understand the authoritarian history of the China. There is actually the authoritarian state tend to collect all of the data, uh, everything uh, for the, their countries, uh, or even for the, some people's uh, got a, a high school degree education. That is, uh, that is happening in many authoritarian regimes, including Taiwan. If you are old enough, okay, you will understand in Taiwan we call about the Ren Er. That has uh, two personnel offices uh, in every government office, in government uh, buildings. The number one is Ren Shi Ju, it's the personnel uh, management bureaus. Number two is the Zhu Zhi Bu, it's the department of the organizations for the parties. And they collect a lot of the data. Collect the data uh, from your education backgrounds for all kinds of the evaluations. And if you can read Chinese, all kinds of evaluations, uh, including uh, some uh, you have been passed some of the exams, uh, everything, uh, and then your punishments uh, and all relevances uh, to the party affairs. Is Qita Ke Gong Zhu Zhi Chan Kao the Cai Liao. So they collect a lot of the data uh, used to be only for the party use and for the party countries and some key persons. But right now become a little bit different. So there are eight uh, credit companies, including the Zhima Xinyong, including the Tengxun. They are all charter companies. They need to be authorized by the Chinese Communist Party to do this. It's not just only some normal business. You can do whatever you can you want to do, and that has been uh, promoted in many different uh, Chinese cities, Shanghai, Zhengzhou, Wuhan, every different cities. So become very prevalent in China. How they do? How they collect the data? If you use Alipay, probably your call phone has been records by then, and your red contacts has been recorded by then, and your fingerprints, your locations, your state device ID, your body sensors, your radio records, your red loggers, and then your SMS, and then some of the messages also has been collected by them. If you use the Apple Pay, use the Taobao, use the T Tianmao, and even you use the WeChat, a lot of people use the WeChat. If you use the WeChat, your data of your call phone, your red records, contacts, your fingerprint location, uh, a lot of things has been automatically collected by then to the party, to the state, if they want to use this information. And then not just only for these companies, for the online behavior, because that is just only for everyone using the phones, using online. But they also collect the data from, for example, from the ministry of the transport, from the Ministry of the Housing and Urban Development Affairs, from the State Food and Drug Administration, from the Ministry of the Finance. And this is a lot of the cameras on the streets to monitor everyone. And they can only collect the data from the utility bills, credit card bills, loan repayment, but also about the criminal records and even also about the academia honesty and then the volunteer activities they can collect the information from the ministry of the domestic affairs and then the pay to the public transportation in order to seduce you to use more public transportation to have the more green life and also online payments shopping behaviors also encourage you to do something online and also about the federal piracy xiao shun so if you uh, do more good for your mothers and parents, uh, you can uh, get more records, you can uh, get more scores. And not just only for the school administration, scholarships, uh, travel abroad, uh, everything. So you can see that if you, uh, for example, if you uh, cross the red lines without stopping, and you will be deduct your scores, 15 points. And if you do something good, you will increase your scores. 
So that is something about the whole score system for everyone. And become the ranking. You have the high score or you have the low score. So if you have the high score, you have a low score, 700 or the 500, 500, and you can do something good or do something bad, it can be for your convenience for your life. So that is a personal information, credit records, comparisons, history, behavior, preferences, and the, another very important thing is about your social networks because they can read your data from your telephones, from your mobile phones to know who you contact with, who you call with, who you have the message with. And if that is someone, the government don't like them. And you will reduce your scores. So your scores is not just only based on your personal information, not just only based on your credit records, but also based on your networks, based on who are your friends. So if you have the engage with the back friends from their viewpoint, and your score will be lower down. So they become kind of the guideline to change your behaviors, to change something that they want you to do. Okay? So for the back scenes, so the criminal people, uh, for some people did some back scenes, uh, 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 didn't return the loans uh, to the to the banks, that kind of the people, uh, of course, they will be punished. And they also the, they did a lot of good things. They also have the, made that your life become more convenient. For example, you can have the free bottle in the battery bank, the Xing Dong Dian Yuan, from many shops. If your score is high enough, they will trust you to return the battery bank in other places. And even for the marriage agency, Hun Yin Jie Sao Suo, because your score is high, you are trustworthy, and you are encouraged to join our group to has, uh, engage with the marriage, even for a private visa. Because applying the visa in China, you need to apply, you need to provide some of the banking records. And right now, use this score according to everything, including your social behaviors, they will become even more trustworthy. So that kind of the things is happening exactly in China. So in the conclusion sections, I just want to let you know these two different uh, smart applications in different uh, political systems. The number one is the democratic smart in Taiwan. We still based on the IT uh, development, also based on the rise of the civil societies. But some transformations, number one is become better, well connected. Right now, civil societies has been much used, the digitalization, use all our online facilities better to connect, to communicate, and even better to do something. And then easy to get started and better presented and more transparent for the budget, for the uh, uh, donation, everything. And then the civil society become much stronger to against the government because they are able to negotiate with the government with the real data, with the open data, with the collective the behaviors of everything. But the authoritarian is become the Dang An. Uh, right now is the written materials become the digital dang an, or di and then become only political issues become everyday life data from the individuals become a network and s become the stay more powerful and that is something about the age of the digitalization we want we want the society is more powerful or we want the state is more powerful Another is kind of the little bit theoretical issues about two kinds of the power. The number one is the Habermas type because of the civil society activities and about the digitalizations. So we actually promote better communications, certainly, and so become the close truth and then the more comprehensiveness. And that is the way of the Taiwan is promoting and is developing the more public spheres. But 
authoritarian mother is become the Foucauldian power. The state try to use the disciplinary power and to develop the kind of the different means and solutions is uh, over the individual bodies uh, and guide them to do something the state want them to do. And even more important uh, is that it's not just only for the criminals, not only all the people did the bad things, but also for the ordinary people to guide them to do something, to cut down some of the friendship uh, that the state want you to do. If you have the bad friends uh, from the state viewpoint, uh, your score will be rolled down. So you will be automatically self-disciplined to do something the state want you not to do or want you to do. So it's kind of the Foucauldian self-disciplined power. The final is about the implication. The Taiwan actually exports or Taiwan try to diffuse this idea to the whole global world. And we use well, the Ministry of the uh, Without Portfolio Tang Feng is present the case of Taiwan to the United Nations Internet Governance Forums to say that is something and that is some experiences, uh, some stories uh, if every other country want to learn from Taiwan, we are more than happy to co-learning, co-sharing together. How about China? Also spreading their models. The number one is China social credit system, not just only for their companies, but also for some of the foreign companies. So foreign companies, uh, they are doing the business in China, also doing business overseas, will be forced to follow up all of the systems and become kind of the interference uh, the other countries' uh, sovereignties. Another is Alibaba is help the Malaysia implement the smart city models uh, from Hangzhou to Kuala Lumpur. So that is another way is China devoting the idea and China promoting the authoritarian smart parties, smart models uh, to other countries. Do we want that to happen? Do we want that to become kind of the the, the programs or the side products of the rise of authoritarian uh, regimes. That is something we really want in Asia. That is something we really want in the whole world. We want the democratic uh, smart practices uh, or we want the authoritarian smart practices. I think that is the time for us to really thinking about it. I just use this Taiwan and China as a case to share with you some of the real current happening about the digitalization and interaction with the political system issues with everyone. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Any quick question before the break? Yeah, Yang, you want to? Um, thank you very much for a very interesting and a very uh, informative comparison. Just a very small question because it is of direct relevance also to a pro program we have at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, and that is with your citizen science mm -hmm. measurements of PM 2.5 yes. uh, aerosol. Um, is that something where there this uh, these are mobile measurements that citizens can carry around and make as they go? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in that case, one of the interesting issues that we've ad addressed and also in a previous European project I was involved is that it is not easy to do the calibration mm -hmm. or to compare it to the fixed yes, station. Yes, yes. And I just wondered <laughs> if you could comment on that in the sense, not just of the technology, but more of the point of what people trust mm -hmm. and whether they, they develop trust because you have to have some kind of means of mm -hmm. validation. Yes, I think I can give a very brief answer, but the, the Tang Cheng is the expert in this field. He can say more. <laughs> I think uh, we are dealing with these difficulties because open data sometimes is painful, that people will not trust each other's data. And government will say your data is not reliable because you, you have the gadgets, problems, or whatever. But we are dealing with that. The other way is when we say about the PM 2.5, sometimes it's about the few signs. It's rather than the laboratory science. So the few science means how to install their gadgets. It's become very important. 
you install your gadgets in the five meters high, 10 meters high, or the 20 meters high, I will quite when will you uh, evaluate the records, uh, the, the times, uh, or the different kind of the uh, political uh, situation, everything. That is also very important. So that is open up more opportunity for the government and for the citizens uh, to talk and the experts to talk together. I think we are dealing with the process and that the process uh, we have learned also can be shared with the uh, Germany uh, experiences or the other countries. Tang you want to say something about the twin 2.5? Yeah, it's basically now there's uh, the sensors uh, and the uh, fixed side monitoring stations are uh, kind of uh, synchronized, it's fine. But absolute numbers, you know, the values are quite different sometimes. So the majority works. So this year we are trying to validate for the government. So that will be by the end of the year, we, we will know more. But uh, so we have to move on, but uh, it's very interesting. So one smart, two system, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, just uh, our friends or our brothers and, and, and across the street always like to have one China policy and uh, hopefully in the future no one smart policy because it's very difficult to have only for coal and not Habermas, right? That's, uh, so thanks uh, 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 for Professor Chen. So, so probably we all have uh, 50.